so I was asked to look at the, <clears throat> the responses to, to violent e extremism. Uh, and again, one of the you know, common findings uh, in all uh, research is that violent you know, extremist groups, they rarely appear in places that are well served by stable, predictable governments and governance systems. In fact, what we have seen you know, in the theaters that are affected by violent extremism, is that the driving force behind the emergence and resilience of non-state armed groups is a combination of two things. You've got dysfunctional states and weak and undisciplined security forces. I mean, time and again, and across desperate countries and regions of Africa, especially fragile countries, we have seen that glaring deficiencies in governance, in particular in the areas of justice, defense, and police, have enabled and fueled extremist activity. In fact, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that in some countries that have been engulfed by violent extremism and armed violence, governments and their security forces have been their worst enemies. So instead of trying to, to build connections in border communities, instead of investing in trying to restore trust between security agencies and aggrieved populations, especially in rural areas, what we have seen, and again I'm generalizing here, is that governments you know, tend to resort to militarized intervention, arbitrary arrests, arming ethnic militias, systematic closing of markets, imposition of curfews, the list goes on and on and on and on, in an attempt to halt these insurgencies. These measures, what well, we have seen in the Sahel and elsewhere, they often end up further eroding local livelihoods, exacerbating communal frictions, and damaging state society trust. In the few cases where governments with limited resources, governments with limited state capacity have made inroads against violent extremist groups. They have generally made efforts to improve relations with local communities, and they have resisted the dominant trend we see in the continent, the dominant trend of trying to outsource the monopoly of legitimate violence to militia groups. And Mauritania and Niger are examples where uh, leaders, they have exhibited their political will to improve not only the capabilities of the military, but also their interactions with local communities. They have made tentative efforts to enhance the capabilities and presence of their civilian security agencies, particularly the police, gendarmerie, detention agencies in border areas. And this is very critical to reducing that debilitating gap that exists between marginalized communities and security forces. Again, we have heard and we have read and we have experienced that the lack of trust between communities in often remote and crisis-hit areas and their government is a common factor highlighted in all the research Right? All too often, communities, they suffer acute insecurity. Communities, they feel let down. They feel targeted. They feel abused by the very state that should be protecting them. So violent extremism, they plug, as you have heard in the presentation, into fear and anger among these communities and locally. So what, I'm try what I'll try to do here is to look at two cases, because we don't have time to do more, that gauge what works and what doesn't encountering violent extremism and terrorism. So the first case is how not to fight violent extremism. And again, here I'm looking at fragile countries, right? Well, Mali. <laughs> Mali is a classic textbook case where poor governance, weak state presence in rural areas, and dysfunctional and abusive state security structures, including the police and justice, have been the driving force behind the emergence of non-state armed actors, violent extremists here. If you look at the post-2012 security crisis, 
that saw much of Mali's north overrun by rebels and by violent extremist groups, the state's inability to protect communities, the tendency of security services to commit indiscriminate violence against civilians that they suspect of collusion with violent extremism, and the resort to the use of informal militias that are even less accountable than the regular military. All of this are among or have been among the most important contributors to recruitment to violent extremist organizations in, in Mali. These dynamics of dysfunctional warfare that have characterized the security environment of Mali long predates the spread of violent extremism. This doesn't start, as, as you know, in 2012, right? In the various uprisings that have engulfed the north of post-independence Mali, it was the choice, the deliberate choice, of the authorities to unleash disproportionate violence and to rely on unaccountable militias while disregarding the demands of the rebels, meaning end to marginalization in the north, end of neglect of the north, recognition of a northern political identity, etc., etc. So all of this played a major role in allowing resentments to simmer, and that what has sustained that cycles of conflict, right? First insurgency, 60 to 63, 90s, right? The 2000s, and then violent exchange. So this hasn't started, right, in, in 2012. And we saw that, I don't have time to get into the, the, the details of, of, that, of that history, we saw that with, with, with President Amado Toumani Touré, who was elected in 2002 and deposed in a military coup in 2012. He tried to manage the northern regions through a combination of several things. First, manipulation of internal divisions within northern communities, right? And then propping up ethnic and clan-based militias and some of whom were involved, as we all know, in trafficking and drug dealings, etc. The, the same problem happened when Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, uh, IBK, was elected in 2013. He was elected with a mandate to restore state authority, mandate to restore trust in public institutions. He didn't either. Right? His tenure had been characterized by corruption scandals and failures in the security, judicial, and administrative realms. The accumulation of all of that is what led to the territorial expansion of violent extremism, the proliferation of ethnic-based militias, and obviously the death of thousands of soldiers and civilians. The military junta that took power in 2020 is pursuing the same old failed strategy. The colonels in power have tried to address the, you know, the weaknesses of the military. It's dysfunctional, right? by investing in recruiting more soldiers, trying to procure more military hardware, especially aerial equipment, right, drones, etc. They also, as we know the story, turned their backs on France, they pivoted to Russia as a new security partner, and, and here the hope is that, you know, Russia can help stabilize their hold in power and turn the tide against these uh, violent extremist insurgencies that are ra raging in the country's center and northeastern regions. Well, the military regime claims that this security rapprochement with Russia and its linked uh, private security company Wagner, they claim it has bolstered the offensive capabilities of the army. It has boosted the morale of Malian troops. Well, the reality on the ground is, as we all know, is still precarious. Uh, so, to be fair, the, the military has shown the capacity to conduct complex operations without the aid of France. So that, to be fair, right? But this has not stemmed the continuing deterioration of security, especially in the north, where the state's presence is still very minimal. In fact, by doubling down on a pure military response that relies on hard counterterrorism tactics, ethnic militias, and mercenaries, the Malians, as I said, are pursuing the same old failed strategy that exacted a heavy toll on civilians and exacerbated communal tensions. The worst part of this dynamic is also playing out next door in Burkina Faso, where the coup leader's very attempts to solve the country's insecurities might end up aggravating the problem. 
As we all know, the transitional military authorities have taken the country's reliance on self uh, ar on, on armed self-defense groups and the civilian auxiliary force to new levels. They have made them the main pillar of their response to insecurity. And this, defen this, this, this dependence stems, from, to be fair, from a capability gap, right? There have been efforts to reinforce security and defensive forces. They hired 3,000 soldiers. They hired uh, 1,400 gendarmes. They have acquired drones, all of that, right? But the military still lacks the manpower. In theory, it, it seems sensible, right, that the, that the military rulers continue to resort to these informal militia groups while trying to revamp security policy, trying to modernize outdated military equipment, hopefully improve the functioning of defense and security force. The problem is that without the proper supervision of these uh, militias, ethnic militias, I mean, there's government massive recruitment of 50,000 additional civilian auxiliaries risk worsening the security situation. Already look at Burkina Faso, the increased militarization of the Burkina Faso society. The recruitment of these state-backed self-defense militias from particular communities, settled communities, not nomadic, settled communities, has already led to a spike in violence against civilians, an increase in intercommunal violent clashes, right? And we have seen an additional recruitment of, you know, some pastoralists into violent extremist groups. So the military's management, I mean, these coup leaders' management of security is repeating the same errors committed by their civilian predecessors, right? So trying to focus on upgrading the military capabilities is a good thing. It's long overdue, right? Beefing up the aerial capability and getting drones and all that. But these endeavors will not come to fruition if they remain restricted to a pure military response, like in Burkina Faso. Now it's all military, all out, right? That gives precedence to arming communities and bolstering the army's manpower. Neither government in Burkina or Mali has embarked on improving security sector governance or accountability. They have not engaged in addressing the underlying grievances that fuel violent extremism, mainly political dysfunction, security forces, abusive civilians, reliance on uncontrolled state-affiliated militias, right? And they have not tackled land tenure disputes and banditry. Now, let's look at what's working, all right? Uh, focusing on Niger. Again, I'm looking at fragile countries. I'm not looking at strong states here, right? I'm not looking at the, you know, Algeria, Morocco. I'm not looking there. Niger is an interesting case, right? That demonstrates that fragile countries you know, have the capacity to absorb and withstand shocks due to internal insurrection and high levels of external insecurity. I mean, I sympathize with Niger, right? Despite being surrounded at the map with encroaching conflicts and extremist insurgencies on its borders, look at Libya, <laughs> Libya on the north, Burkina, Mali on the northwest, Nigeria southeast, yeah, but Niger has shown remarkable resilience, nonetheless. It's very fragile, no doubt. It can still, obviously, you know, falter. But unlike its troubled neighbors, violent extremist groups have not been able to establish permanent sanctuaries in the country. They have not been able to occupy large swaths of territory, besides a small portion in the Lake Chad Basin. So this capacity to hold out against multiple destabilizing forces has been largely due to the will of the highest authorities in the country to adjust policies as conditions dictate. So these were deliberate policy decisions that were taken. Right? Yes, context matters. We can talk about that. So the ability to learn from countries' past struggles, Niger's own struggle with insurgencies, as well as that of its neighbors, is most evident in the country, in the way the country has managed insurrection and violence that it has confronted since independence. Niger has also been rocked by insurgencies, as you know. But unlike its Malian neighbor, with all the respect to Malians, obviously, the authorities have had the political wisdom to politically integrate minority groups. Right, look at the example of Bray Grafini, Tuareg, who served as Minister of Agriculture in the 1980s, and then Prime Minister of Niger from 2011 to 2021. And that's a testament, you know, to the level 
limited but level of access to power that minorities have been afforded, right? The government had also been more proactive in addressing some of the political grievances of the Tuareg rebels. This is before violent extremism. The ruling authorities, they enacted decentralization policies. They have devolved some administrative functions. They have allowed local authorities to spend 15% of the locally generated mining revenues. They also took greater care to integrate ex-rebels into the state and security apparatus. So the point here is that the government of Niger, it's not perfect, obviously, uh, but the government of Niger has taken deliberate decisions to avoid inflaming local conflicts among border communities. Niger has been wary of the mobilization of vigilante groups, right? Has been wary of trying to mobilize ethnic militias to fight insecurities. I mean, obviously, Mali offers a powerful warning about what happens when you subcontract conflict management to ethnic militias. So, so you have that powerful counter model right there, right? But Niger's concerns about the potential of militia groups, you know, to exacerbate local conflicts, the propensity of these groups to go rogue or to be politically instrumentalized, Right, stems from the hard lessons that Niger learned from its own experience fighting insurgencies in the 1990s and in the 2000s, the Tuareg, and the, the ethnic Tibu rebellion that hit the country's portion of the Lake Chad, 1990s. Uh, what happened in the, in the Lake Chad is, uh, uh, version is that Niger struggled to demobilize these militias, Fulani and Arab militias that helped it fight the Tibu rebels. Niger also learned from the mistakes it's made in two th recently, 2017, 2018, with French support, to be fair. You know, uh, uh, they learned when they collaborated with the Malian, Dosak, and Tuar community armed groups. They were fighting the so-called Islamic State that was just emerging in 2015. All right, so they collaborated with, you know, uh, with Malian, Tuareg armed groups, with the support, French air support in this case. But the, the, this military partnership, what it did, is that it fueled deadly armed confrontation between communities, as well as boosted the recruitment for the so-called Islamic State, especially among Fulani men, because the Fulani young men were disproportionately targeted by this joint offensive, right? So the authorities had to reverse course, right? And they have suspended pursuing policies that carry you know, heavy, heavy costs. That's why Niger has resisted the mobilization of community armed groups. Uh, the authorities, they have prohib prohibited civilians from arming themselves, man in roadblocks. They demand instead that vigilante groups, they work as an informant network within the army civil military cooperation teams, right? In areas that that are hit, hard hit by insecurities, and the government is unable to protect civilians. Well, if you can't protect civilians, well, civilians have to do something to protect themselves, right? In this case, the authorities, they have come to terms with the emergence of these, you know, militias, but they have made efforts to press them to register with civilian and security officials. They have also, and this is all a work in progress, right? But they have also provided alternatives for communities to be involved, local communities, in the state security efforts at the local level. For example, the authorities, they have started special training programs for young people in border communities to join the National Guard. Right? And it's still a nascent uh, 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 program here. But the hope is that the integration of communities in these local security initiatives would improve relations between security forces and border communities, and it will facilitate the authorities' efforts to calm these intercommunal tensions, right? The government's you know, handling of, of these multiple insecurities that have confronted the state is what have spared it from the worst fate of, I think, of its Malian and Burkinabi 
uh, neighbors. So the experience of Niger illustrates that fragile governments, weak governments, right, that are willing to learn from their mistakes, that are willing to learn from their failures, can withstand shocks in this case. Niger is certainly, as I said, I'm not painting a rosy picture, okay? I mean, the Niger is, is certainly very volatile. I mean, despite some progress, you know, poverty is still prevalent, particularly in rural areas. Ethnicity remains a polarizing issue in the country. It affects politics, military recruitment, communal relations, armed conflict. So Niger has also has not entirely avoided the stigmatization of some communities. They have made efforts right, to arrest that, but it still happens, right? But nonetheless, since the country's transition to democracy in the 1990s and its return to democratic order after the coup in 2011, the government of Niger has made deliberate, and the focus here underlying is deliberate decisions to address these extremist internities in a multi-dimensional way. It's a work in progress again. Uh, Niger's approach contrasts with the regional trend. Burkina, Mali, right? Instead of relying on foreign mercenaries, instead of relying on ethnic militia groups, I'm not saying ethnic militia don't exist. I mean, in cases where the state is, struggles, right? But the authorities have pursued a deliberate strategy that combines military action with genuine political efforts to try to ease tensions among border communities, try to develop stronger ties with them. Nigerian security forces, they worked also to try to professionalize their security response. It's a work in progress here, right? There have been investments in equipment. They need their drones as well, right? Uh, improvements in training. Uh, you need improvement in tactical preparedness of the forces. But there have been efforts by the authorities to try to exercise oversight over military operations. There have been an awareness raising campaign led by the presidency and the military high command of the necessity to improve relations between defense and security forces and rural residents. Again, it's a work in progress. And this has paid some dividends in some areas. Look at North Tilibera, right? There have been increased cooperation between state authorities and local communities. And this has contributed to the breaking up of the so-called Islamic State Intelligence Networks. This is the group still operates in the south, southern Tilib western Tilibari, and there was an attack in north Tilibari, to be fair, uh, uh, recently. Right? The, and, I'll, and I'll stop here. The, the government also invested in trying to promote reconciliation and dialogue. <laughs> I know we talking about negotiation yesterday. The government initiated talks and, and community mediation efforts. So the first thing you need to do is how do you reduce intra intercommunal tensions? That's, uh, if you want to deal with violent extremism, you have to tackle that. And this led to the signing of a peace agreement between Fulani and Zarma community in Banibango on January 2023. And the deal is quite significant. Because violent extremist organizations, they exploit these conflicts. And this conflict between these two communities have been going on for decades. So the fact that they, they struck this deal is, is, is quite significant. Niger has also extended what the current president calls an outstretched hand policy. To try to reintegrate militants who renounce violence, there have been several efforts to how do you win, right? people from these extremist groups. In 2021, there was a special committee of largely poor Fulani emissaries under the leadership of the interior minister, right, to reach out to these local Pearl commanders, right, to figure out whether you can peel them off these groups. And this builds on the work that was done in 2015 with Boko Haram, uh, you know, defectors in in, in, uh, in DFA region. So again, it's a multi-dimensional, not trying to paint a rosy <laughs> picture here, right? It's very vulnerable, uh, Niger, it's still fragile, but nevertheless, the improvements that we have seen is based on deliberate policy decisions, and it shows us that fragile countries uh, 
are not obviously doomed right, to disintegrate or to experience what with the with the neighbors with the neighbors have. So I'm sorry I just centered it on, on these two cases. There are other cases to, to look at uh, but for purposes of time I'll just stop here.